Thanks, Mark. I was going to say the intro is longer than the talk. All right, so enter and then double click and it's going to roll, right, Thomas? All right, here we go. So the Creative Vision Factory, we're located between 6th and 7th Street on Shipley Street. It is an art studio funded by the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. We maintain an open drop-in art studio for all artists on the behavioral health spectrum. Uh, we're an all-inclusive environment. We'll accept anybody into our doors. You want to think about the high school art room ripped out of the school system and just plopped right on the street and open to everybody. That's how we serve. That's how we, that's how we operate. And so uh, being in downtown and serving the population that we serve and doing the work that we do, we learn all kinds of ills and all kinds of challenges that our members are facing at any given time. A uh, third of our membership is experiencing homelessness at any given moment. Um, the other two thirds practically are uh, clients of, of various service providers in downtown for various mental health and substance abuse issues. And so for us, when we, uh, this, is, this is us at the Calmar Nickel Mural, we've also done a program of uh, public artworks in addition to uh, fostering the development of the individual art practices of our members. But for us, when we uh, saw, you know, a few months back, this uh, Newsweek article called Murder Town USA, uh, for us, it wasn't that big of a surprise. Our members, everyone that's there at the mural has a story that would connect to an even more horrific tale of the tale of two cities that was forecast in this article. You know, so a lot of people, you know, when this came out, I heard a lot of people say, well, that's not, that's not the only thing that I know. And uh, when I read it, I thought, hey, this is probably the first piece of journalism that actually detailed the city of Wilmington that I do know. Uh, being a member of the art community and the position that I'm in, I get to navigate these two worlds every single day. I could be breaking up a fight at 7th and Shipley Street. Later on that afternoon, I could be at a lecture at the Winter Tour. Thomas, Thomas, hurry up. What's going on? <laughs> Screensaver. All right, so when this article came out, one of uh, the Creative Vision Factory's close friends, Nancy Josephson, who's our neighbor, uh, came to the studio with this idea. Uh, she was really pissed off. She wanted to do something. She said that, you know, what can we do? And, uh, you know, one of the things that we say at the Creative Vision Factory is probably the most radical thing you can do is get money in the hands of people. And so she had this excellent idea to take bullet casings and transform them into earrings. And so we would transform these earring, these bullet uh, shell casings into earrings and then ultimately would develop a line of earrings out of the Creative Vision Factory. So every artist that was making a, a pair of these earrings would ultimately get maybe like a, a third of the proceeds of the sale. We'd have another third of those proceeds go back into materials and another third, we would want to pull into a fund to fund entrepreneurial workshops that we would maintain at the Creative Vision Factory, but also take out to the community. Uh, so Chantal and Nancy are over here. Big shout out to Chantal and Nancy. They've been working on various uh, variations of these earrings. Chantal has uh, really kind of blossomed and has made uh, tons of different variations. And as we've been making these, we've been trying to figure out, okay, like, what are people going to like? You know, what are they gravitating towards? So the past few months at the Creative Vision Factory, we've been doing a lot of research and development with these earrings. Uh, the members that we have gravitate towards these things immediately. As soon as they see them, they're like, wow, you know, what's this about? Can I get involved? Can I do something? And a big part of what we do at the Creative Vision Factory, I tell everybody this, I told then uh, candidate Dennis P. Williams this, that it's just simple opportunity cost. The more time that somebody has to do one thing, the less time they have to do something else. I'm not going to sell you on this kind of warm, fuzzy happiness and emotions that the art studio provides. It's just simple opportunity costs. Let's give people an opportunity to do one thing over another. Let's also give people the opportunity to generate a little income, a little revenue. So many of the members that I served uh, in our first year at the Creative Vision Factory, every week are asking me for 10 bucks. Every Wednesday when they get a disability check, they pay me back that 10 bucks. Now that they're able to manage sales of their artwork, their prints, and then in the future, hopefully more of these earrings, 
those asks of ten to five dollars or money for a bus ticket are few and far between. And so we need to get capital out there. So this is the part of my talk where I want 15 seconds for this just to ease into your brains, this concept. Eugene Young for mayor. <laughs> if you don't know this guy, get to know him. All right? So Murder Town USA. Uh, these are the nice cards that were uh, created by Brad Wasson for us. We need help. If you have contacts, if you have a boutique, if you have somebody who, you know, you do some marketing or you got some ideas, come see us between 6th and 7th Street on Shipley Street and help us bring this to market. Again, a third of the proceeds we want to pull into an entrepreneurial workshop. We recognize that every artist that comes through our space has the capacity to create a micro-economy around themselves. Let's do it. necessarily in a galaxy far, far away, but if you were to get in your car and drive 10 hours north, you would end up in London, Ontario, Canada, and 20 years ago you would have met me, Mr. Excuse. And at a point in my life I was unhappy, I was making excuses, and someone said to me, you are where you are because of something you did or did not do. What a powerful statement. Since then, hundreds of times I've said that to myself, whether I'm proud of myself or I'm disappointed, but it prevents me from making an excuse. People say, if only. If only is the start of a dead end. If only I had more customers. If only I had more time. If only the economy was better. If only I had more money. Money is an interesting thing, and a lot of people will tell you that it takes money to make money. But I'm here to tell you that I disagree. I think it takes passion. If you've got passion, money will come. Here are nine companies. We all know most of them are multi-million dollar companies. They've got a household name. They all started in a garage with nothing but passion. If you want to start a business, it takes a little bit, but it doesn't take a lot. It takes a little bit of money, so let's look at what we eat for breakfast and lunch. It quickly adds up to $15 a day, a little over $5,000 a year that you're spending that's not including drinking at a bar or going out for dinner. And listen, I'm not telling you to starve yourself. I'm not telling you to make a dramatic change in your life, but I'm asking you for $5. Because $5 is $2,000 a year. $2,000 a year could do a lot for you. You could invest in education, which would generate more money for yourself. You could invest in your health. Me, I would say invest in the business because that's what I know and that's what I believe in. Every one of you has unique talent. You just haven't figured out how to make money with it yet. Maybe you don't need to start a new business, but all you need is a new product or you need a great product, and you need excellent customer service. Customer service to me is something that I would consider a dying breed. I deal with over 50 vendors a year in my business, and I can think of one that's got outstanding customer service. The rest of them are mediocre at best, slow response times, they just don't get to you. But no matter what you do, you have to have a commitment. And you've got to commit in here, you've got to commit in here, and you've got to make a commitment to yourself, and once you do, all of a sudden you've got the power to alter your destiny. And when you commit, next thing you gotta do is you gotta make a goal. And you gotta write down this goal, you gotta read it to yourself multiple times a week, multiple times a month. I'm in tech, I use email, I don't use paper, and I'm actually a high school dropout. Me and paper don't get along, but I write down my goals and I read them myself. The reason I do this is because something about goals and watching your progress and reading them back to yourself makes things happen. I can't explain it, I started doing it about three years ago, I didn't believe in it but it works. So grab a piece of paper and write down a goal. Another excuse I hear about is time. And I don't understand, I mean, you guys over there, you, you got eight hours to work with, and you guys got like 14 and a half, in the middle we got 24. I mean, we all have the same amount of time. You just have to make time work for you. Earlier I showed you about $2,000. If you took $2,000 to start a business and joined a couple local chambers, you could go to over 60 events per year. And I can hear some excuses. 
Networking doesn't work. It's always the same people. My target audience isn't there. And I can tell you from experience that people like to do business with people they know, like, and trust. The fact of the matter is, is that we all need customers. Without customers, your business doesn't succeed, and networking is an easy way to do that. And if you want to tell me that networking doesn't work, I've generated over $500,000 in business in the last two years. So I'd have to disagree with you. Networking is a beautiful thing. It works exponentially. The problem with it is, most people give up, is it takes four to six months before it really starts to, to work. After a year, you see your results, and after two, it's exponential. Three and four times the growth that you saw the year before. So take away a couple things from here today. Put away the excuses. Make a commitment. And take some risk. People always say that risk equals reward. They're not lying. The one thing that always stands in people's way is fear. And fear is a very powerful emotion. Fear has the ability to stop us all in our tracks and sometimes make us do a 180. But the unique thing about fear is that only you can give it the energy. You can take it away as easy as it comes. So my suggestion would be replace fear with passion. Because passion is far more powerful and passion can change your world. So chase down passion like it's the last, night of the, last bus of the night. at a low, low, low place in my life. Life sometimes throws things at you, like a flood coming at you at top speed, and life can be very dark, very, very dark. But at that time, when you are faced with struggle, oftentimes you get taught a lesson. I'm a teacher, I like lessons. You get taught a lesson. These times in life make you even more. They make you be challenged, they make you grow. As I was going through this dark time in my life, I experienced what I call my change triad. I met, well not met, I researched uh, two people and met one that absolutely changed my life. The first is my life coach, Joe White. The second is a shame researcher, Brene Brown, talks all about vulnerability. And the third was a blogger named Glennon Melton. She is just a person who taught me to show up in life, human and messy, and just see where life takes you. If you look at this plant, the plant represents life. It represents growth, change, breathing, evolving, and beauty. That's what we want our life to be like. If not, let's face it, if you're not living, you're dying. If my team here hears me say that. Um, you're dying in some way, whether it be spiritually, emotionally, physically, and let's face it, life gets drab and dull and boring. This coach pushed me to go beyond my comfort zone and said, step out of that little circle you're stuck in and step in to where the magic happens. And once I started doing that, my life became much more magical. One of the ways that I made this change was getting out of my comfort zone and stepping into fire. And so you'll see this burning, burning fire in just a moment will become something that I will go through and I will have in front of me. There I am on the 1200 degree coals with my husband. And that pushed me to think about limiting beliefs, the way that maybe I do live in comfort, maybe I need to feel certain when I'm going through life. But what I've learned is that you've got to be uncertain in order to have what you want in life and to be living your best life. So I've now begun to look for uncertainty as I'm traveling and saying, I'm gonna go down that road. This is a quote from Tony Robbins. As you see, the quality of our lives is directly related to the amount of uncertainty that we can live with comfortably. It's true, if you want to be great in this life, embrace uncertainty. You see my turtle friend here, laying on its back. Can you imagine being that vulnerable? Laying on your back saying, oh, oh you know? And the thing about vulnerability is, you can get hurt along the way. That turtle can definitely get hurt but you've got to keep being able to be tickled. Tickle, tickle. Um, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. You've got to step out of um, that need for certainty and say, I've got to embrace this thing. I love this card. A ship in port, it's safe, but
But guess what? We're not ships. Or we're not ships, but also ships uh, aren't built for that. So don't let fear hold you back. Be willing to get hurt. And if you embrace these things, uncertainty and vulnerability, your life will become more meaningful. This is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, change, showing up and being seen in life. You're human, you see my human here. And oftentimes when we wanna make change, we wanna change everybody around us, but we don't really wanna change. I'm challenging you, change you, and that changes others. Heck, we could even change the city. My question to you is, what are you waiting for? Being human is hard and messy, but let's start making that change today. Step out of your comfort. Step into vulnerability. Embrace uncertainty. What are you waiting for? It could change your home life, your work life, your relationships. It could change your emotional well-being. Think of the possibilities. If you just step into, like I did, the fire, how things will change. I believe as a life coach and as a person that the best is yet to come. So each day as you step into your work world or your home world or your life, think about that each day something new is going to come that will change it for the better. I encourage you and ask you to go to my website, Solomon Life Coach, learn about me, learn about my story, and certainly I'd love to chat with you and talk and spread the good news about uncertainty and vulnerability. Thank you. Please continue to do so. Um, so I'm not going to talk about much of any of uh, what you just heard about. Um, I'm going to talk about fate or karma or kismet. Um, you find yourself uh, at times uh, faced with circumstances that will change your life. And I'm going to talk about some of mine. So they say luck is preparation plus opportunity. I'm going to add choice to that, and that's going to help you find out if it's going to be good luck or bad luck. Um, and so, if you come with me, I'll explain how I got here tonight. I'm going to take you all the way back to the summer of 94. Life was simple. I was an art student trying to fulfill a lifelong dream. Uh, I had resolved that I would be starving and alone. Um, and then fate stepped in. I, w I went to a, a friend's house within bike riding distance because my car wasn't available. And he had some guests there, and one of whom I fell in love with instantly. And she was about to move to Hawaii in two months, and I was living in, around Philly. Um, so I had a choice. What do I do? Uh, I knew what it was like to be alone. I did not know what it was like to find true love. And so I figured I would go for it. And after a couple of weeks, we got engaged, and 20 years later, we're still married. Um, and there I was. Followed her out to Hawaii in paradise, and there was this weird buzz about this thing called the internet. And I felt like if I didn't learn about it, I would get left behind. Uh, so I had it in my mind to do more with the internet. Meanwhile, I was working at a deli, trying to pay the bills while I was trying to be an artist, and I went out back to have a cigarette, and all the matches in my matchbook fizzled out. So I went out front, bummed a light off a guy, and I asked him what he did, and he said he ran a web design company. And the next day, I started interning for him. Uh, and that is how I got to do all the things that you heard about in my intro. So I worked 70 hours a week for free while still working at um, the deli for a chance to be part of history um, and found myself a job. I then moved back to Philly and for about five years I designed and I coded uh, and I was always wondering am I learning the right things, am I studying the right languages, or the, uh, should I be a designer or a programmer? And then I heard about this word called usability, which is the science of making websites easier to use. And I realized that people will always need things to be easy. So I started using um, some free resources online to learn about this. I had a manager who let me switch careers, and I worked a couple jobs at the same time. I found a mentor who's the bald guy on, uh, on the right there um, who helped teach me how to do this stuff. Uh, and I built a good reputation and worked for the the companies that you heard about before. I worked a lot. I worked 
um, 14 projects a week, 80 projects a year. And in the beginning, at the largest agency in Philly, which was all healthcare, um, but was really all pharmaceutical, and I felt like something was miss missing. I liked the idea of doing healthcare work. Um, so I told my wife, I wish I did more health, more, more meaningful stuff, maybe for a nonprofit. I wish I did some freelance, I did some strategic work, and she said, why don't you volunteer to do strategic work for a nonprofit? So, <laughs> you see my preparation. So, um, a friend of mine, right after that, asked me if I would do some freelance for breastcancer.org, and I wound up working there for five years, and we doubled page views, and I got to meet patients and inspirational people. Um, and that was good, but remember, I wanted to be an artist, and I had a son on the way, and I thought, I had this image in my head of a, a closet filled with paintings, and my son saying, did you ever do anything with that? And so, um, a friend of mine, I started painting seriously, and a friend of mine said, hey, there's a gallery that would be perfect for you. You should show there. So I contacted the gallery owner, and she said, I saw your stuff on your website the day before. And I got a solo show. Eight months later, I was able to bring my six-month-old to that show. I had 25 shows after that, and a couple in Brooklyn later this year. So what I learned along the way were a few things, but one was to follow my heart, because uh, while failure passes, regret lasts, and you can't feel bad if it doesn't work out if you did something you believed in. So one more piece of luck. Uh, I had my second son on the way. The company I was working at closed. I was out of work, uh, and I had lunch with a friend of mine who knew everybody, and he said, oh, that's great that you're asking, because the Archer Group um, needs somebody who does what you do. They just had a va vacancy. Um, and so pretty obvious decision, right? There was another opportunity at the same time that was a little closer to my house, but um, Archer was great, Wilmington is great, that's how I wound up here. So thanks to them, thanks to you guys, and uh, hopefully you can learn something from my story. All right, so when I first started off as a photographer, the best unexpected benefit was that it forced me to focus on things I used to overlook or take for granted. I began to unsee and re-see things and break away from patterns, assumptions, and labels. I found myself seeking out the most beautiful places in the world to see if I could capture their essence, or find something different in places that had been photographed many times before. What you're seeing here is the wave, a sandstone formation at the end of an unmarked six-mile hike into the desert. In Hawaii, rainbows can be so prevalent that sometimes you'll see them resting up against mountains. It's, it's really ridiculous. Um, but going to places to take, uh, going to beautiful places to take photos is easy, but returning to the real world can be a letdown. <laughs> Lewis, one of Louis C.K.'s best skits is "Everything's amazing and no one is happy." Where he talks about people flying through the air at 800 miles an hour and 40,000 feet up, and everyone's complaining about the Wi-Fi not working. So we live at a time where amazing and beautiful quickly becomes invisible. Uh, two years ago, I started hiking every Sunday morning with a group of friends, and we did it for exercise. We realized that we were relating to each other and our surroundings in an entirely different way. It slowed our worlds down. Uh, Fifteen people walking in silence can really be a revelation. Uh, the hikes have surprised me again and again and reminded me that there's magic all around us if we're willing to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, this is an aphid if you get really, really close to it, like the way you might have done as a kid before it just became another bug. Uh, photography taught me to expect surprise. Things that once seemed like lucky timing started to show up more and more. This happened at a, a house concert in Arden. Uh, the thing I love most about it is the expressions of the people in the background, not necessarily the fire. So what happens if you get flat on the ground to see something? Climb to the top of a stadium or crawl into spaces you never imagined going into? Uh, this is what happens if you take water from an everyday garden hose and freeze it at a shutter speed of one five thousandth of a second. Sometimes we can actually witness curiosity in the wild, and it's unmistakable. This was taken at a show at the Grand that I don't remember at all, but I do remember the little girl watching it. Curiosity connects us with the human spirit because it is in all of us, usually hiding. Sometimes curiosity allows a stranger to show something awesome. I was walking back from a shoot when this guy asked me to take his photo. I said, sure, but you have to do something worth photographing. I do this all the time now. It's always worth it. Sometimes curiosity leads us to something spectacular. I chased a sunrise one fall morning until I found the right foreground for it. Now that image is on the cover of the state of Delaware roadmap, and probably the shot of mine has been seen by most people. 
Sometimes we can create curiosity through fun and surprise by taking something and turning it on its head. The zombie is a videographer at Mobius and the ballerinas rehearse upstairs and the shot ended up being the Fringe Fest poster image a few years ago. Um, infrared photography is a kind of photography that shows heat energy which our eyes cannot see. Uh, this is Gibraltar right smack in the middle of Wilmington. Even in disrepair it's glorious and in, the infrared, in an infrared it looks like a gar the Garden of Eden in winter. So our patterns and assumptions could be prisons. In a town like Wilmington that gets zero positive press, there is beauty everywhere. Standing on top of Christina Landing on a clear day, the colors of the skyline compress into almost watercolor-like tones. Right now, Wilmington curiosity is driving progress, and I can see it every day as the city reshapes itself into one of the true creative and technological hubs of the area. Take a walk down the path leading to the Peterson Refuge and just see it with fresh eyes. Even when the building you were sitting in was at its ugliest, it was still a beautiful space. A number of people looked at this collapsing shell and wondered what might happen if, and the queen has never been as dynamic or essential. Curiosity drives vision. When exercising curiosity, you start to attract magic. When shooting this fall photo of Chelsea, who happens to work here, uh, a tornado of leaves surrounded her. If you know her, then you know she has a way of making things like that happen. Curiosity creates possibility. You, you can exercise curiosity in your own backyard. Anybody know what this is? Time's up. <laughs> this is ordinary bamboo held up to the sun and shot with a, um, an iPhone. It's like something from a Kubrick film. There is wonder right under your nose. Exercise curiosity and you start to attract magic. Apply this to relationships, to work, to life. These are some of the people I photographed recently for the Ian Wilmington campaign. All of them interesting, surprising, and beautiful. Curiosity didn't kill the cat, it thrilled the cat. It taught it how to live. A.H. Almas said, the fulfillment of our life is to see life objectively, to see what's really there. Life is the expression and fulfillment and celebration of beauty. This is what we're here for. We're not here for anything else. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my life as a college professor. Uh, I founded a couple companies, but my main job is a college professor. And one of the challenges is of a college professor is we're always trying to understand the next generation of students that we run into. Um, I teach marketing, and marketing for all intents and purposes is a pretty simple um, segment of business. It has very simple rules, but tends to be simple, yet not easy. And I also am a big fan of something called edutainment. Now, edutainment is basically a combination of education and entertainment. It was first used in 1948 by the Walt Disney Company. Um, I know it more from our friend up there on the screen, KRS-One, uh, from his fourth album, uh, Edutainment, in 1990. Uh, but I'm trying to use this with students in school. So let me tell you about one of my students. Her name's Jen. And I've talked about how you know, marketing is simple but not easy. She came to me after class and said, well, let's put that into practice. I'm looking for a date. I said, I'm not into that. She said, well, you can help me with marketing. So I said, well, let's try this out. So the basic concept of marketing is marketing segmentation. That just basically means we divide up the market into specific segments. And so, Jen, do you like blondes? Do you like brunettes? Do you like old guys with glasses? What is, what is the thing that you like the most? We, and from that, we derive an ideal client. So her ideal client looked like that, brown hair, green eyes. He's very nice. Um, very easy guy to find, right ladies? Right. Of course. Now another part we have to figure out is what we call the ideal transaction. So Jen, what do you want from this guy? Well, I want to go out uh, to dinner once a week. I'd like to go out every once in a while and I'd like him to take me to a couple of date parties. Sounds like very fair. So when you get the ideal client, the ideal transaction, we have what we call the target market. Those are some of my students from UD, maybe you recognize them. And so the target market represents the person that you want to attract. So whether you're a person or a business, that's the person you want to attract. Now we need to make sure we know some things about the target market. So we do market research. Now is that target market, are those people identifiable, reachable, responsive, sustainable, and profitable? For Jen, that means, I guess, going to dinner. Uh, times are tough for college students. And so we realize that there's a number of people that fit into that target market. So now, Jen, we have to work on your positioning strategy. This means what is the idea you want these people to have in their mind about you? She said, you know, Dan, I want them to think I'm sophisticated and classy. 
a very fair sophisticated, a very fair strategy for most people. And then we also need a differentiation strategy because a lot of other women out there will want to be seen as sophisticated and classy. She says, Dan, I love wearing roses. This is the point where I start rolling my eyes. Like, okay. So you're gonna wear roses wherever you go. That's a good differentiation strategy. So after you figure that, we need price. So I said, Jen, what do you usually drink when you go to the bar? She says, Bud Light. I said, that's a bad idea. <laughs> because that does not fit in with your positioning strategy. You order a Grey Goose Martini, three olives, that says sophistication and classiness. Now, what's your usual promotion strategy? Dan, I like to sit at the bar and like wink at guys. Like, that's also a bad idea. Uh, especially around Newark at night. That's not gonna work out well for you. So maybe what you might wanna do is have like a long gaze at them and then look away. That's in the movie, so that must work. So then, what's the place? So she mentioned a specific bar in Newark. I said, that's a really bad idea. You're not gonna find that guy there. So maybe you wanna do some research to figure out where do young professionals hang out? And that makes a ton of sense. And when you put together positioning, differentiation, and the four Ps, you have the product, Super Gen, right? And so it's the person that really lives those principles that she wants. She was happy with that, and two weeks later, she got her guy. Incredible, marketing works. So one of the things that it taught me was that edutainment can work. If we try to engage people, engage students in a process where they're not just reading out of a book, they're not just looking at theories, but they're actually incorporating the material in their life, they will actually learn. So for example, I taught a sales class once, and I figured what better way to teach sales? We're gonna go out and sell cars. So we went to a local car lot, and we sold cars, because if anyone here's been in sales, you know you don't understand it, until you feel like the bubble guts, like if I don't sell this, I won't be able to pay my mortgage. That's what the kids felt. Every year we have something called the scramble, which is where I drop all the students off of Main Street, and say you have three hours to find a business owner, write a business plan for them, do competitive analysis, and then pitch your ideas. In some years, we've actually had students follow them with cameras. It's been great. And then gamification. Every class, we have a speaker, and that speaker tells them about a marketing problem, and the students have to pitch ideas, and the student who has the best idea gets some monopoly money they use at the end of the year. So our real challenge here is the next evolution of education is really engaging students and making them own the concepts we're teaching. Students, especially millennials, are completely different, so we have to teach them in a completely different way. Thank you very much. I know. Before we start that, I want to just say one quick thing. It's really, I don't know if it's good to go last or good to be first, because I would like to take a slide from every single presentation and make mine totally different at this point. So um, I think everybody was really incredible, so hats off to everyone. Thank you. I, I was here to again. So anyway, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, thank you for inviting us. We appreciate it. And uh, we're going to have our five minutes of summing up what we do and what we are doing tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, we want to help keep Wilmington original. So thankfully, we, we didn't realize we were going to give this great introduction, so we have a disclaimer moment, which is awesome. If we don't get through everything and we get cut off because 15 seconds is ridiculously quick, come find us afterwards and we'll keep on talking about what we were talking about. So, so um, you heard in the introduction who I am and how I was inspired to start a music business. I, again, there's a lot more I can tell you. I am um, a very, very socially active with foster care kids. It's a very important okay, piece, yeah, and yeah, Jerry. Yeah, so uh, this is gonna happen all night. Uh, I'm born in Wilmington, I'm a musician. We're both entrepreneurs. We started Gable Music Ventures. I went to Delroy College of Art and Design. I do a lot of booking of a lot of musicians, basically. And so you'll see my daughter on there, and that is part of the inspiration of Gable Music Ventures with Jeremy before he turned gray doing this business. <laughs> this is what inspired us to start our business, Gable Music Ventures. My daughters need to write and perform. So our first show, pre-Gable, uh, was done out of need. Uh, my little brother wanted to play, Gail's daughter wanted to play. No businesses in the area that could do it, so we rented this place in Yorkland. Called it the first annual Yorkland Rock Showcase. There's never been another. And there's never been another first Gable event either at the uh, Jewish Community Center. This, one, uh, this was our very, very first show as a legitimate business. Um, it was uh, a great night of music. I 
can't say much about it other than that. Wilma Rock Circus. All right, has anybody in this room ever heard of Wilma Rock Circus? Thank you. We've been doing this for four years. This was a Joe Trainer idea. He said we should put ten bands on two stages, best bands in Wilmington, call it Wilma Rock Circus, and that's what we did. And we've been doing it for four years. And Ladybug Festival, those of you who are followers, July 16th this year. 40 female performers are going to be coming down. It is a block party. It is a free community event. It was July 16th, I said that. Rockabilly Rumble, we created with World Cafe Live at the Queen. Uh, it's a beer garden, it's barbecue, it's uh, flea rockabilly. market, rockabilly, swing music. It happens outside, inside, in this room. It's happening on Sunday, August 23rd. So what you see on this slide is a collage of posters of our singer-songwriter showcase that we've been doing for four years all over the city. Phil Brothers, Chris White Gallery, and here at, at World Cafe Live. We've been doing it a long... Right. Oh, oh, yeah, so it's always six artists. It's always three hours. It's all original music. It happens every month. This month it's happening on uh, May 15th. Uh, the guy in the bottom center, Jacopo, is originally from Italy. I'm gonna be playing drums with him this month. You should come and check it out, so be fun. So these are um, icons of, of the businesses that we booked, some of the music venues that we are booking right now, and we are building our business. We are bringing revenue into Wilmington. We are revitalizing our city by bringing people in to see music. Very important piece of what our business is all about and why you're here tonight. We pride ourselves on being able to put the right artists in whatever situation we uh, take on, whether it's a coffee shop, a farmer's market, World Cafe Live at the Queen, whatever. Or, or one of the larger pieces that we've been involved with, which is doing special events. Uh, we have a big event on, well not a, a huge event, but on May 2nd, this Saturday, with Wilmington University. So we, we come in and we consult on a lot of new music events. Which brings us to... Yeah. Wilma Wednesdays, which is tonight uh, and every Wednesday here at World Cafe Live at the Queen. This is what we were here to talk to you about. This is what Will Minster said. You guys should be the last presenters right before tonight to talk about it. Um, so this is kind of something we, uh, oh yeah, this is, this is when I didn't realize how fast 15 seconds went by. I apologize. So you can go on to Wilma Wednesdays, you can go on to Gable Music Ventures and you can read this entire quote, which is from Katie who works here, who was really impressed by the last week that we did. Um, there is a ton of incredible variety that's happening tonight. We've got stand-up comedy, we've got seven different live music performances that are each gonna be 15 minutes, five different comedians that are uh, from Philly and Wilmington that are each gonna be performing for five minutes in between. This is gonna start at 7.30 tonight, so if you wanna stick around and enjoy, there's no charge, there's no upcharge. Uh, that's me and my favorite new shirt, which is from Space Boy, uh, right down the street. If you don't know Space Boy, you should. This is the schedule for tonight. Uh, if I look overwhelmed, it's because I'm doing this every week. Uh, it, it's gonna be an incredible uh, incredible time. Please stick around. If you like original music, uh, it's just gonna be, uh, it's gonna be wonderful. And, and support our city. Support our city. Come out and be, be a part of what's happening.